Welcome climate viewers. My name is Jim Lee, the climate viewer guy with facts minus fear porn. And I'm here to give you a presentation on the chemtrail secret for weather warfare, geoengineering and ozone destruction. This presentation will be free of charge. There will be a PowerPoint presentation in the details below. Please like subscribe and comment below. Let me know what you think. Please share this with as many people as possible because this is going to be highly informative and full of references. Carbon black dust and soot, the secret for weather warfare, geoengineering, and ozone destruction. It is crucial for artificial cirrus cloud creation, weather warfare, geoengineering, and ozone destruction. Carbon black dust and soot is released in the exhaust of jet aircraft by burning fuels as soot or dumped or pumped from military aircraft as carbon black. Carbon black and soot are often used interchangeably. However, carbon black is manufactured and soot is the unwanted byproduct of combustion. Carbon black has military and scientific uses such as increasing cirrus cloud cover, increase or decrease precipitation, dissipate fog, and hurricane modification. Soot comes from commercial aviation and has weather modification and geoengineering effects such as increased cirrus cloud cover, alters rainfall patterns, affects solar radiation by cooling by day and trapping heat by night, contains metals coated in sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid or acid rain. Soot is filled with metals such as chromium, iron, molybdenum, sodium, calcium, aluminum, vanadium, barium, cobalt, copper, nickel, lead, magnesium, manganese, silicone, titanium, and zirconium. Considering that some fraction of soot can effectively act as an ice nucleating particle and that a dominant fraction of ice residuals in cirrus clouds contain metal compounds, the presented findings support the assumption that aircraft em engine emissions can act as ice nucleating particles or cloud condensation nuclei or just generically called a cloud seed. This leads to ozone destruction. Though airborne, black carbon is known to dissipate and settle down in a few months under the influence of rain and wind and is unlikely to travel upwards of 4 kilometers. However, a group of scientists from India say they now have evidence of such particles existing up to 18 kilometers in the stratosphere and that there are about 10,000 of them per every cubic centimeter. Given the shape and location of these black carbon particles, they argue it could only derive from emissions of aviation fuel and they pose a problem because these black carbon particles can linger long enough to provide a fertile ground for other chemical reactions that can deplete the ozone layer. Interestingly enough, David Keith, famous geoengineer, talked about this, photophoretic levitation of engineered aerosols for geoengineering. And he talked about how engineered nanoparticles could exploit the photophoretic forces, enabling more control over particle distribution and lifetime than is possible with sulfates, perhaps allowing climate engineering to be accomplished with fewer side effects. And he was specifically talking about levitating uh, aluminum, titanium, and barium up into the stratosphere with magnetic forces and or photophoretic forces which are caused by the sun heating them. So what happens if we lose our ozone layer? It would kill all plant life on the planet, cause non-melanoma skin cancer and malignant melanoma development, and cataracts in humans kill all marine life including phytoplankton and developmental stages of fish shrimp crab amphibians leading to a breakdown of the whole marine food chain and uvb radiation could affect all the other greenhouse gases on the planet ozone destruction was also um, talked about by a famous scientist named harry wexler and he was specifically talking about rocket exhaust Wexler was concerned that inadvertent damage to the ozone layer might occur if increased rocket exhaust polluted the stratosphere. 
He said, inadvertently, destroying the ozone could happen through increased pollution from rocket exhaust or near-space experiments could go awry, like the unknown risks of Operation Argus, which was an upper atmospheric nuclear explosion, um, Project Westford, where they dumped a whole bunch of needles in space, little metal dipole antennas, and Project Highwater, where they used a Saturn V rocket to dump water in the, the ionosphere. Or on purpose, as Chapman proposed making a temporary hole in the ozone layer for the benefit of astronomers, or more nefariously, possible military interest in waging geophysical warfare by attacking the ozone layer over a rival nation. You can read all about this by Jim Fleming on the possibilities of climate control in 1962, Harry Wexler on geoengineering and ozone destruction. There is also a PowerPoint presentation associated with that. Following his untimely death before he could really make these uh, warnings known to the world, the Rand Corporation published Pollution of the Upper Atmosphere by Rockets, where they went on to talk about using lithium and other chemicals and saying, hey, this would be a good idea. Coincidence? I think not. So you can read all about that and watch the videos on YouTube. Chemtrails from space, sounding rockets, satellite chemical releases, and ionospheric heaters. Or check the references on climateviewer.com in the article titled Aluminum, Barium, and Chemtrails from Space. Because this is a real big one for the ozone destruction. So to sum all this up in an infographic I created, we have flights here and you can see that this is the troposphere where we live. This is the stratosphere. And here's the ozone layer, which is around 12 to 9 miles or 20 to 30 kilometers. And they were finding all of these metals up to 18 kilometers possibility that they are infecting the ozone layer is extremely likely. Sounding rockets and satellites, they spray trimethyl aluminum, TMA, barium, lithium, and sulfur hexafluoride from sounding rockets here, satellites in space here, and then ground-based microwaves cook these chemical plumes, these chemtrails in space, to do many different things like trace um, upper atmospheric winds, to see magnetic field lines, or to do space weather modification. And I give three examples at the bottom. Ionospheric heaters like HARP, which are 3.6 million watts. The sea-based X-band radar, which is a mere 450 kilowatts, but it is an X-band radar and has a range of 3,000 miles. And then ARPA's long-range tracking instrument radar, Altair, which has a range of 70,000 miles and is 6.4 million watts. How these all interact, very complicated. You got the D layer, E layer, and F layer of the ionosphere over here on this side and the different layers of the entire atmosphere on this side. And if you'd like to see all of the ionospheric heaters and missile defense radars and all of that, you can come over here and check out this uh, map available at climateviewer.org. Artificial cloud creation history. And for this, you would really want to go check out weathermodificationhistory.com. So in 1958, Jet trails dim sun Palm Springs gripes. And basically they were saying the contrails are not disappearing but breaking down into a haze and creating a cloud-like appearance in the sky. So they went to the Air Force with this and the Air Force basically told them to screw off. Air Force gives village two choices. Live with the trails or move, 1959. Let's face it, men, said a crisp-talking, star-studded general, you'll either have to live with the vapor trails or move the city of Palm Springs. The resort area, it happens, is known as the Palm Springs Intersection, the freeway interchange of all West Coast aerial traffic. So the city officials and civic leaders in an apparent unanimous unspoken agreement decided that a peaceful coexistence with the Air Force was the wisest course. How's that for chemtrails 1958? Also in 1958, Navy scientists creates clouds, breaks them up. Navy creation destroys clouds. Ordinary carbon black is used. 
Now, Dr. Florence Van Stratton was interviewed for this, and she said, We dropped carbon black suspended in a liquid over a track of a mile long and produced a solid line of clouds one mile long. When we dropped one and a half pound dry packages of carbon black, we produced single clouds with each drop. The Navy team seeded seven clouds with carbon and dissipated each of them in from two and a half to 20 minutes. Each cloud turned gray and then rapidly disappeared. Aside from the cost of the airplanes, we spent less than $5 on the experiments in Georgia. Carbon black is used in printers, ink, and automobile tires and is nothing more than soot. <laughs> so this is from 1958 and the United States Navy was creating and destroying clouds using carbon black. Then came John F. Kennedy, our president. We shall propose further cooperative efforts between all nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. 1961. Following him, we have Lyndon Johnson, who says, It lays the predicate and foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather and he who controls the weather will control the world but that's not all he said he said from space the masters of infinity would have the power to control the earth's weather to cause drought and flood to change the tides and raise the levels of the sea to divert the gulf stream and change temperate climates to frigid scary stuff indeed in 1970 Two states sued over black belch and cirrus clouds. And this is quoting the article from the St. Petersburg Times, 1970. The government will tell the nation's 43 commercial airlines Tuesday that they must end pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. By 1972, or face punitive legislation from Congress. Now, that's an interesting term they used. Pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. That was chemtrails, 1970. Also in 1970 was this scientific paper on the possibility of weather modification by aircraft contrails. And one of the quotes that stuck out for me in this is, Likely contrails are affecting precipitation to a much greater extent than present deliberate cloud seeding operations. Check the link. 1974, weather modification by carbon dust absorption of solar energy or how to use carbon black dust to steer a hurricane. We will be revisiting this idea in the present. A high-flying theory on the acid rain problem. The one culprit that really causes it, in my opinion, is the exhaust spewed out by jet airplanes that travel through our skies constantly. I've seen instances when the blue sky, after a few hours, is laced almost completely in every conceivable direction, but mostly west to east, by jet contrails. By afternoon, the sky is clouded over as they spread out. The jet's exhaust is already up there and only has to have a change in atmospheric conditions to precipitate out as acid rain. Acid rain is something you don't hear about anymore. Weather warfare. Now this is the smoking gun stuff that most people have never heard anywhere. In a top secret document, there's a section that says previous USSR weather modification efforts. Then there's a big redacted box. But then it says, this demonstrated an ability to generate infrared defeating clouds, effectively denying overhead surveillance. Infrared defeating clouds. Interesting. Weather modification using carbon black, proposed by the U.S. Air Force Phillips Laboratory. In the paper, Weather Modification by Carbon Dust Absorption of Solar Energy, the one we just mentioned, they talked about solar heating of carbon dust could be deployed on a theater scale to achieve precipitation enhancement, to create cirrus clouds, and to dissipate fog and low clouds. Then we have the U.S. Navy's FOIA, also from 1994. Title, Non-Lethal Warfare Proposal Weather Modification. 
This is from China Lake. Interestingly enough, China Lake created the cold cloud modification system bombs that were used in Operation Popeye when we did weather warfare over Vietnam. Capabilities and uses to impede or deny the movement of personnel or material because of rains, floods, snow, blizzards, etc. to disrupt economy due to the effect of floods and droughts. Successful completion of this proposed effort and follow-on E&MD programs will give the U.S. military a viable state-of-the-art weather modification capability again. I know of no countermeasures. Then everybody's favorite fun toy, owning the weather in 2025. But interestingly enough, in this think piece, as they put it, was this chart. And the chart says, Carbon Black Dust 2005 to be developed by the Department of Defense. Right there, CBD 2005 stands for Carbon Black Dust technologies to be developed by DOD has a star. This figure illustrates the system's development timing and sequence necessary to realize weather modification capability for the battle space by 2025. Now, if you thought owning the weather in 2025 was just a think piece, think again. Then came a joint army air force meeting called test technology symposium 97 weather modification by Dr. Arnold Barnes Jr. Wait for it from the Phillips lab, which was mentioned in the FOIA we just talked about. He says the use of carbon black to retard precipitation, fog dissipation and cirrus enhancement carbon black making cirrus clouds stopping rain you get the picture from his presentation two slides weather modification using carbon black increased precipitation muddy dirt roads to decrease tractability flood fields with small and small rivers decreased true comfort level decreased tractability by snow or freezing rain when temperature conditions are right decreased precipitation dry out roads or fields for improved tractability deny fresh water to troops in semi-dry regions Ooh, that's just nefarious and the smoking gun weather modification using carbon black page two increase cirrus cloud cover now why do they say they want to create chemtrails to create cirrus clouds Deny visual satellite or high altitude reconnaissance. Decrease light level for nighttime operations. This is similar to the SpaceCast 2020 where they said infrared defeating clouds that could block out spy satellites in space. Deny visual satellite or high altitude reconnaissance. Or make it darker at night so that our night vision gives us a distinct advantage. And of course dissipate fog. Uncover targets for visual raids, provide visual inspection of damage, provide visual reconnaissance or open airfields for landing or recovery. And over here, um, they have the, these are from the notes from the presentation. Engineer designed for airborne carbon black delivery system completed 2004. This would line up with the owning the weather paper saying 2005. And the, in the, in the bottom of the notes is a very interesting statement. Build upon NOAA's Atmospheric Modification Program, AMP, a joint NOAA state's effort written into NOAA's budget every year by Congress, and the Illinois State Water Survey studies on inadvertent weather modification. Illinois is one of the states that sued over chemtrail smoke pollution of the sky and have been studying them ever since. And then number three, articles in the Journal of Weather Modification. So this was their plan, increase cirrus cloud cover using carbon black dust. Interestingly enough, NATO is also somewhat to blame for um, our current cirrus cloud problem. And it was called the single fuel concept. And this um, happened from 1988 to 1997 where they converted their fuel from gasoline to kerosene. 
conversion from JP4 to JP8 begins here. And these are some additives that I've put in there. The stratospheric wells back seeding patent happened in 1992. Uh, plus 100 additive or a hits additive test began 1994. Owning the weather was 1995. Conversion to JP8 complete, 1996. The weather modification test technology symposium we just went over was March 1997. August 1997, uh, Edward Teller's geoengineering proposal, aka can Dr. Evil save the world from global warming? Teller, Wood, and Hyde, and Ken Caldera at Lawrence Livermore National Lab came up with the current geoengineering proposals. October 1997 plus 100 additive is in 1,000 U.S. Air Force jets. And 1997, the chemtrail conspiracy begins. It's the first time the word chemtrail was ever used on the internet. And the first article ever about chemtrails was about JP-8. And as you can see here, we got two charts. This is showing the, you know, real world implications of what's going on. Ideal combustion, but it's never ideal. It's this is real combustion. This is what you end up with. And right about here, see soot. And they even talk about that, you know, down here. What does soot do? Uh, microphysics, clouds, cloud radiation, and all of this impacts climate change, uh, agriculture and forestry, ecosystem energy production, and consumption, social effects like all of us bitching on the internet about chemtrails, and welfare loss monetary units. So this cause, costs people money. But as you can see over here, in the conversion from uh, JP4 and JP5, you can see just in JP5, there was 2,144 parts per billion of aluminum, and JP8 had 9,360. That's more than three times the amount of aluminum in this new dirty fuel they chose. Calcium went from 5,000 parts per billion to 31,000 parts per billion. Strontium from 70 parts per billion to 351 parts per billion. Titanium from 35 to 1,056 parts per billion. So as you can see, all the way down the board, JP8 was a very, very dirty fuel. And the dirtier the fuel, the, the worse the soot would be. Coming back to carbon black dust and that whole idea of steering hurricanes, 2008, the hurricane modification workshop happened at the Department of Homeland Security. And at that Homeland Security meeting, you can see the link here, Hurricane Hacking, the Department of Homeland Security enters the weather modification business. Dr. Mosh Alamaro from MIT had a paper called On Hurricane Modification by Carbon Black Dispersion, Method, Risks, Mitigation, and Risk Communication. The presentation focused on the use of carbon black aerosol instead of dust, they call it CBA, to selectively heat parts of the atmosphere by dispersion of CBA above a hurricane. And you can see over here in this um, diagram, they show soot coming from a C-130, which is a U.S. Air Force plane, um, being dumped out of the back into a hurricane. Fleet of transport aircraft flying at 50,000 feet drop soot in the path of a targeted areas of a hurricane and you can see the soot cloud here soot is warmed by the sun heating the cool air around it at the very top of the hurricane this reduces the flow of air within the hurricane and it slows it down depending on where and when the soot is dropped the now weakened hurricane will change course so here we go same idea from 1974, Gray et al., um, carbon black dust absorption of solar energy, but presented by Dr. Mosh Alamaro at the Department of Homeland Security to steer hurricanes today, to establish cause, effects, and outcomes of CBA dispersion, and to develop methods to communicate risk to the public of large-scale weather modification efforts. Ruffle. Which brings us to contrail control. Cocktail geoengineering, how 9-11 changed the sky forever. On the day of September 11, 2001, all flights were grounded. And as a result, in skies normally cross-hatched with condensation trails, the only contrail seen in this image from September 12, 2001 were left by the plane returning President George W. Bush, Air Force One, here in the middle, to Washington from Nebraska and several escort fighters F-16, F-16. 
So they were able to study this, and, and they, what they realized was that on this day, there were no clouds. For several days, there were all flights were grounded, and as a result, the diurnal temperature range increased dramatically. And what that showed was that on cloudless days, it actually got colder at night. And this let them know, oh my God, cirrus clouds are trapping heat at night. This was the first aha moment. Next came a volcanic eruption. Jim Haywood wrote a paper um, called A Case Study for the Radiative Forcing of Persistent Contrails Evolving into Contrail-Induced Cirrus. Contrail-Induced Cirrus is a cirrus cloud, is what everybody calls chemtrails. You know, it's a contrail that doesn't go away it ends up making a cloud. And in this picture, you can see an E3 AWACS plane that's doing circles, and slowly that fans out to cover almost all of Britain. And he said, a single aircraft operating in conditions favorable for persistent contrail formation appears to exert a contrail-induced radiative forcing some 5,000 times greater than the recent estimates of the average persistent contrail radiative forcing for the entire civil aviation fleet. Atmospheric science seeing through the contrails by Olivier Boucher. He said, contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. That is a huge quote. So if these clouds are trapping more heat than all the CO2, then seriously, we have a problem. So to try to solve this problem, jet biofuel enlisted for contrail control. Contrails may be the punchline in cultures these days thanks to the imaginative folks who've rechristened them chemtrails and embroidered them with elaborate theories involving government and corporate misdeed, but contrails are pretty serious business for the less conspiratorial reason. Scientists believe these ice clouds generated by water exhaust gases from aircraft engines could have a real impact on the climate, perhaps by cooling temperatures during the day and warming them at night. That's when the new phase of, in an ongoing NASA study comes into play. The space agency recently began doing flights over Southern California desert in which a DC-8 flying laboratory is testing the contrail consequences of using standard JP-8 jet fuel versus a 50-50 blend of JP-8 and a biofuel made from camelina plants. Over here on the right hand side we have all the different biofuels. They're also known as alternative aviation fuel or alternative jet fuel. And you can see they come from different sources like the camelina plant, algae, um, things like that. These are called lipid based fuels. Carbohydrate-based fuels such as sugar cane, chicken fat, and then over here, coal and natural gas, which can be turned into sin gas or bio oil or sugars or hafa fuel or all of these different forms of, uh, you know, biofuels is what they're called. They're not just going to leave it alone at that. Adding aluminum nanoparticles to jet biofuel, J-Trofa biodiesel, a fuel derived from crushed seeds of the J-Trofa plant, water, and a surfactant, then blended in different proportions of alumina nanoparticles. In addition to outperforming regular biofuel, the nanoparticle spiked fuels produce significantly lower quantities of nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide gases and created less smoke. The researchers are now testing other types of nanoparticles including hollow carbon nanotubes and investigating the effects of nano additives on engine lubrication and cooling systems. One obstacle is that nanoparticles should be used judiciously because they tend to entrain in human bodies. Nanoparticles can go through the human blood brain barrier and cause all kinds of problems like Alzheimer's and all of those sorts of things. So to fight back, August 11, 2015, I made a EPA hearing happen by submitting my thoughts on this to the EPA and they tried to talk me out of coming. Instead, five of us spoke, Jim Lee, myself, 
Max Bliss, Patrick Roddy. This is Max Bliss, Patrick Roddy, Amanda Bays, and not pictured Michael Saraceno. We went to the EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C. and spoke. Did the EPA listen to our warnings? You betcha. So did the Obama administration, the ICO, and the rest of the world. Working overtime during an extremely contentious election, the election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the powers that be gathered wrote an agreement to use biofuels for contrail control and dropped our EPA lawsuit hearing. Once again, the airline industry skirted the law, just like they did in 1970 when they were sued by the state of Illinois and New Jersey. July 25th, breaking EPA to limit greenhouse gases coming from airplanes. July 31st, 2016, White House releases Federal Alternative Jet Fuel Research and Development Strategy. September 3rd, 2016, China, U.S., and Europe pledge support for Global Aviation Emissions Pact. September 12th, 2016, Greens moved to dismiss EPA lawsuit over airplane emissions. And then a full year later, and I warned about the whole biofuel thing in my speech, non-governmental organizations slam UN Aviation Agency plan for biofuels. Oh, the irony. And that was me speaking on C-SPAN at the hearing. And I said, why is the EPA claiming that six greenhouse gases emitted from jet planes are a threat to human health under the Clean Air Act while doing nothing to address ongoing lawsuits over leaded aviation gasoline or the real health concern of stakeholders worldwide, cancer causing heavy metals in fuels and their additives, and aviation-induced cloudiness as they like to call it so this has now come you know out into the public and technocrats have decided to replace natural cloud formation with technological fixes dubbed accidental geoengineering like ship tracks and aircraft contrail induced cirrus clouds and you can see on the left hand side mit we're about to kill a massive accidental experiment in reducing global warming with ship tracks and on the right from smithsonian magazine airplane contrails may be creating accidental geoengineering and they're all, not just referring to the cirrus clouds themselves chuck long from nasa's CRES or system research lab he said that they were creating a subvisual ice haze which was whitening the sky so if you look at the horizon and you see how white it is and you look up and you see it's bluer that white haze he's talking about is very fine crystals of ice that are coming from all of these aerosols coming from these planes they want to call it accidental geoengineering so let's talk about geoengineering dope jet fuel deployment by plane running on dirty high sulfur fuel at cruising altitude airplanes could add plenty of so2 or sulfur dioxide to the stratosphere what did i tell you soot is wrapped in sulfuric acid and sulfur dioxide it raises itself up into the stratosphere it's already doing that past volcanic eruptions have cooled the earth substantially by ejecting sulfur dioxide gas into the upper atmosphere atmospheric scientists have proposed that so2 already emitted in vast quantities in the lower atmosphere by burning fossil fuels could have the same cooling effect if it were lofted into the stratosphere which planes are doing a fine job of doing that already here is a long list of scientific papers on doping jet fuel i will not read all of this to you but things like use commuter aircraft fuels doped with aerosol generators wide area seating with soot or carbonaceous aerosols carbon black dust a potential delivery mechanism for seating materials already in place the airline industry stratospheric injection of sulfur species dissolved or suspended in their jet fuel and later burned with the fuel here's another one from alan robach addition of sulfur to the fuel released through the exhaust system of the plane injection of sulfuric acid from an aircraft Inject sulfate aerosols emitted by aviation fuel into the stratosphere, FICA cool project. And then finally, the one that they're working on today, applying high fuel sulfur content at aviation cruise altitude, combined with ultra low sulfur jet fuel, biofuel at lower altitude resulted in reduced aviation induced mortality and increased negative RE compared to the baseline aviation scenario, AKA if we 
spike fuel with sulfur and burn it at flight altitude up in the troposphere at the very top of it and use biofuels on takeoff, we will kill less people around airports because there'll be less soot emissions, black belch, and there'll be more sulfur in the sky, which is geoengineering. They are testing that in two different tests we have here. Three different fuel types are discussed, a low sulfur JP8 fuel, a 50-50 blend of JP8 and Camelina-based HAFA fuel, biofuel, and JP8 fuel doped with sulfur. And that's from the access flights. Alternative fuel effects on contrails and cruise emissions. Access to flight experiment right there. And then over here on the new one, they did access one and two where they flew behind planes and sampled the chemicals coming out of the trails. And now they've got the new one, the NASA DLR Multidisciplinary Airborne Experiments, NDMAX, also known as Emission and Climate Impact of Alternative Fuel, ECLIF-2. So they're currently testing these biofuels for contrail control and testing fuel doped with sulfur. This is why it's all creepy. When I interviewed Dr. Rangasai Halthori from the FAA's Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative, he said we would like to have more contrail-induced cirrus clouds during the day and none during the night. Dr. Ulrich Schumann from the Germans DLR said we want less warming and more cooling contrails, predictable for operational planning. And um, Ken Caldera and company said if the time and place of seeding is selected with care, the climate effect of cirrus thinning can be enhanced. What is cirrus cloud thinning? Talking about that in just a second. For that, only the long wave warming effects of cirrus clouds should be targeted and their solar effects should be avoided. This can be achieved if seeding is limited to high latitude winters or nighttime seeding. And what they're talking about is not solar radiation management. They want to keep that during the day. They want to block sunlight. But at night, they want to allow the outgoing solar radiation or earth radiation management, ERM, something you probably never heard of. Everybody talks about solar radiation management, SRM. But earth radiation management is the new name of the game is melting cirrus clouds away so that the heat can escape back at night. Here's a little bit more on this whole idea of dope jet fuel. Stratospheric sulfate injection with commercial aircraft. This is from the FICA Cool program. Commercial aircraft could be used to deliver sulfate into stratosphere by increasing fuel sulfur content and the flight altitude of intercontinental flight. The sulfur content of the fuel should be increased to about 50 times the current level to have a significant cooling effect. And Ulrich Schumann came up with something called the Contrail Cirrus Simulation and Prediction Tool, which allows them to figure out when and where they're going to make these cirrus clouds and what impact it's going to have on the climate. Is it going to cool? Is it going to heat? And that allowed them to come up with this at the ICAO Colloquium on Aviation and Climate Change. Dr. Ulrich Schumann made the statement, Less soot emissions, less warming, and more cooling contrails predictable for operational planning. And this was at a contrail mitigation discussion. So they talked about using two fuels in one tank. And I always scratched my head about this till we came across these patents. Fuel system for vapor trail control. Fuel delivery system. Two jet fuels in one fuel tank equal contrail control. There's the numbers right there. And finally, controlling the supply of a vehicle with multiple fuels doped with sulfur and biofuel. So that way they can have a choice between the two. Jet fuel electronic control unit can change the mixture of the two. This may explain the on off cirrus clouds that we see. This is the plan. Use two fuels in one tank, one loaded with sulfur, one with no sulfur. And cirrus cloud thinning, which is cirrus cloud seeding to destroy clouds at night or thin them out. Ulrich Lohmann, a cirrus cloud climate dial. 
sedimenting ice crystals remove water vapor, the most important natural greenhouse gas, water vapor, from the upper troposphere. If cirrus thinning works, it should be preferred over methods that target changes in solar radiation such as stratospheric aerosol injections because cirrus thinning would counteract greenhouse gas warming more directly. So what they're saying there is if they can actually thin out these cirrus clouds that they're creating, they won't need to do stratospheric aerosol injection or geoengineering SRM, which they're already doing. This is from the video link right here. This right here, cirrus cloud seeding, suggested seeding material, bismuth triiodide, cheapish non-toxic seeding via commercial airlines. Solutions, what are we gonna do about all this? Well, how to deal with the problem of secret weather modification. Commercial, don't fly. Tell the airline industry you're grounded. Demand that the ICAO, FAA, NASA, and the DLR pursue options to stop creating cirrus clouds, period. They should not be allowed to create them by day and none by night and continue to block out the sun. This threatens the solar industry. Everybody who's involved in the solar power industry should be up in arms over this because they have agreed to create clouds all day long to cool the planet. That is going to screw the solar industry. Among other things, there are predictions that by 2050, terrestrial astronomy will be a thing of the past because they won't be able to see the stars at night. Scientific, support the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Demand transparency worldwide requirement to give prior notification before experimenting in the sky. Build a sensor network to detect illegal weather modification and geoengineering activity. Military. Support the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Give the Weather Warfare Ban of 1978 teeth. Build a sensor network to detect illegal weather warfare activity. Pursue a complete ban on space weather modification, ionospheric heaters, and sounding rockets. You can see this link at climateviewer.com slash nmod, that is the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. To prevent all of these technologies, this is the 10 technologies to own the weather today. Uh, if you download the presentation, simply click on this picture. It'll take you to the article, and it'll break down all of these for you. But they are ionospheric heaters, sounding rockets, satellites, lasers, cloud seeding, cloud ionizers, stratospheric aerosol injection, ship tracks, contrail induced cirrus, and water vapor pollution. All of these are technologies that can be used today to control the weather worldwide. So please support the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. It is available at climateviewer.com slash nmod. And I want to thank you for listening to this very long presentation. I hope that you will download this PowerPoint and share it with others. Feel free to email it to anybody. Please give a link back to the original video. And never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And you can see my information right here. Um, my name is James Franklin Lee Jr. And that's my address, my phone number, my email, my Skype. ClimateViewer.com, ClimateViewer.org, WeatherModificationHistory.com. Please support my work on Patreon.com slash ClimateViewer, PayPal.me slash ClimateViewer, or GoFundMe.com slash ClimateViewer. Please subscribe to me on YouTube, and this presentation will be permanently available from ClimateViewer.com slash CirrusCloudsMatter. So that is my presentation on carbon black dust and soot, the chemtrail secret for weather warfare, geoengineering, and ozone destruction. I hope that you will share this presentation with others, and I hope that you will understand it because you need to be one of the, that small community of thoughtful individuals who understand the problem so that one day we can clear the skies and have clarity about the secret world of weather modification geoengineering and weather warfare once again i'm jim lee the climate viewer guy and i appreciate you watching this long video and i hope that you will continue to support my work information is power and with power comes great responsibility so i hope that you will use this information to attack ideas not people